Hello YouTubers, welcome to Backyard Astronomy and <coughs> welcome to Green Bird Observatory. Uh, before we get started, that's a couple things I need to lay on the line here. Uh, first off, we got bad weather all the time. Number two is uh, I use a OCS, which is a one-shot color camera, and uh, that's usually all I shoot with. Uh, all my cameras have been that. Uh, I don't do not have time to do lengthy photography with. If I'm going to shoot a picture for two hours, it's going to be color. Uh, I can't shoot three or four. Uh, filters and, and then a luminous filter and have eight ten hours tied up in, in one picture um, I just don't have time for it uh, not with the weather I have here and as often as I get to shoot it's, it's very pitiful so that being said uh, if you need to find out about uh, the mono, uh, mono, mono camera and using filters there are other websites that you can check out that do have a lot about that uh, on this site, we are working with beginners, and we're also working with one-shot color. This will also work pretty much with DSLRs. Um, so that being said, let's get to what we come here for today. Today we're going to talk about something called Setup for Deep Sky Imaging. Wonder what that is. Come back and we'll find out. Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about set up a deep sky object imaging. Sounds heavy, doesn't it? <coughs> well, excuse me, it is uh, a little bit heavy, but uh, every time you go out, you need to have a game plan. You, if you go out without a game plan, you'll spend more time trying to get stuff to work, kind of like what I do, or you're going to shoot pictures, one or the other. You're going to do one or the other. So it's best to have a game plan so you can get everything together before you get out there in the dark. Doing it in the dark is a little bit rough. Um, I've come up with a game plan and made a little outline of it. And uh, you're welcome to copy it down. In fact, if I was you, I would do just that and keep it handy uh, near my telescope. Use it for a couple of times when you go out and you will eventually have a smooth running night. I know I haven't had one lately, but <laughs> we'll get there. Okay, let's have a look at it and see what it is. Okay, this is a diagram, or actually a outline, of what my game plan is I'm talking about. You see it's in two parts, one called pre-planning, and the other one is set up telescopes. And you notice there are only eight steps in setting up your telescope. Now, we're going to talk about pre-planning first. Weather. What is it we can do about weather? Well, on weather, we can look at the weather channel, we can get on the iPads and tell or the computer, and we can find out what uh, uh, the weather channel has on there. Uh, we can do all kinds of things like that to see what it is. Another thing you can do is look out the door. But that's not going to tell you what's going to happen tonight. Uh, if you live where I live, it's so unpredictable, you, you kind of play it by ear. So weather is kind of, we're kind of hung up there. We have to we have to kind of plan our night around the weather period. Choosing your objects for imaging. You say, well, I know the objects I want to I want to pick. Well, that you need to go a little further than that because the sky changes over periods of time. And just because you remembered something was there in the east or something was there in the west doesn't mean it's there now. So bef before you ever go out, the day before, during the week, or whatever it is, you need to pull up a program like a planetarium uh, a stellarium is a planetarium or uh, starry night that's another one it's a few other programs have uh, planetariums in them you can get on and, and google and you can download a couple of free ones that will actually be pretty good uh, what you want to do is you want to look at the objects in the area that's available to you in your area I mean sometimes you have trees sometimes you have houses so you you need to know what's available visually out there first so, once you do, you can actually determine what objects it is you want to look at uh, or photograph. Uh, another thing you have to take in mind is how long are you going to have? Uh, so, say for instance, you're only going to get about three hours, uh, maybe four. You, you can't get out there at one or two o'clock. So, you're only going to have a couple hours. You need to set up 
uh, maybe one object or two objects, because you're going to want to film these probably about maybe an hour a piece or two hours a piece, whatever you're doing. And uh, so getting you five or six things all lined up for one night that it's not going to be good seeing all night is not, not a good plan. You need to decide what you can get away with, how long, and don't shortchange it. Do what you can do and try to do it good. Uh, that's about all I can say for that one. Now, if you'll look at this here, I only have two things there. There is a third one. I'm not going to put it on there because uh, it's not a thing you have to do all the time. What I'm referring to is particularly any kind of programs that you have that do any kind of control work. Say like PhD2 for your guide skirt. <clears throat> it has to be installed and it has to be set up. Now, you may not be able to get it operational to the first time you go out there, but you got to get the stuff installed. That's a lot of information that you've got to put in there. Uh, any other programs that you're using that require information or setup before you ever use it the first time, you need to do all this ahead of time. Now, now what I'm saying is that it's a one-time deal. You don't need to do this every time you get ready to plan to go out. <clears throat> it should already be done. Uh, there are some other things that you can do, like align your scope, uh, uh, set your uh, all, uh, all your equipment up, tie your cables down so they won't get hung up. Make your pad to put your portable scope on. We're going to talk about that one too. But anything like that that you need to do ahead of time, that, so it will always be there and already be done. You won't have to deal with it. Well, so I guess we could say that uh, that number three, that's imaginary number three, is probably very important. Don't forget about that. You got memo in, uh, in the video that we did that was uh, introductory to astrophotography. There was a lot of things we went over uh, about what kind of equipment, programs, and all that stuff you need to do, alignment, collimation, and all this. All that stuff needs to be done during the daytime or any night that you can do it but not when you get ready to go imaging it should already be done so you need to get that kind of stuff took care of and then that's not even on the list for it for a night now it's mentioned but it's only mentioned because to let you know that you have if you haven't done it you need to do it now that's the reason that it's on there so we're going to look down at number two uh, but uh, uh, the second part of it which will be I'll set up the telescope itself. So let's go down and have a look at that. Okay, now we're going to be looking at set up the telescope. Like I said, there's eight things here. First thing you see on the list is it says locate telescope to site. Now what does that mean? Well, it could mean that you have a portable scope that you need to uh, set up before it gets dark, or you have an observatory. And we're going to deal with both of them. The main thing here is that you got to let it cool. Some of these small refractors that you're using and some of the uh, reflectors uh, probably only require about 30 minutes to cool off. Maybe 45, maybe. Uh, I'd, I'd give it 45 minutes. Go get you a cold drink and let it, let it rip. Now, if you've got a big SCT, uh, it might take you as much as an hour. That all depends on how long the observatory has been shut up in the daytime and the sun's beat down on it. And... Uh, it might take you a little longer. Remember, uh, SCT is kind of closed up on both ends, so it's going to hold the heat in there. And you got to get it out, or you're going to have some sorry pictures. Even for visual, it's not any good. You've got to let the, sto uh, the scope cool off. Okay, so let's look at a portable. I say here that you've got to level it, you got to balance it, you got to polar line, you got to drift line, and you got to locate your power source. And you got to sink on three stars. Now, some we'll talk about that one in a minute. I said level, balance, and pull out. You got to do this every time. Especially look at this down here. It says drift line. Yes, you got to do that until you get it right. Now, here's what happens: if you've got a portable scope and you carry it out every time you put it out, you may not. Like I told you before, you, what I would do is have one leg designated for the north <coughs> and set that down first. You may not get it in the exact same place every time. And if you don't, the polar line and the drift line are definitely going to be off. Now, you've got a polar line every time when, anyway. 
Drip line you can probably get away with if you take care of these other ones first. How can you do that? You remember what I just mentioned about making a pad? Set it on. Sure, you can go out to a flat driveway, have it already marked where you want to put your scope every time. Even mark it for what the leg number is going to be, which one it's going to be there. You can have your telescope all pretty much set up. A lot of people with a portable scope don't leave everything connected. So remember, right here is where you've got to hook all that back up. So the most that you can get done ahead of time and treat it like a semi-permanent uh, installation, the better off you're going to be and the quicker you'll get going. <clears throat> you still will have to do this on any portable uh, unit. Now, down here, you locate power. Sure, you got to get your powers out there and you got to get everything going, get it hooked up. And you got most, most scopes if they're a go-to or something, we'll have you sync on one, two, or three stars. One of those stars is probably going to be part of the polar line. Uh, my scope will allow me to sync one, two, or three, all depending on what I've got in here. I'll tell you about that in just a minute. But you'll have to sync on some stars. And you need to do that so the scope will know where you're at. Now, these guys who have a scope that has a GPS on it uh, will have a, a lot easier time here than other guys who don't. All right, if you have an observatory, what am I going to do there? Look at the first thing that happens here. Open the roof. Why? Let it cool. Take the covers off your uh, both ends of your scope and let it cool off. Turn on your power source and sink on, uh, pick a star and sink on it. That's all you have to do with an observatory because it's a permanent mount. In the permanent mount situation, you've already done all this. And all you have to do, since this is already done, it's not likely to get that far out, if at all. You may have to do a drift line maybe once every six months. Some people like to check it every month. Uh, <laughs> I, I, if it's a permanent mount, I wouldn't worry too much about that. But you do have to sink on one star. Why do you have to sink on one star if it's all permanent and all set up? Well, because when you turn power on, it's going to go some crazy way. It never goes where you think it's going to go. I've never half seen mine do it. I've had it for almost well, 18 years now, whatever how long it's been. And uh, I would put it on a star and sink it. And when I do, it knows everything I want to go to. Uh, because it's already really polar lined. Everything, it's been drift lined, it's been polar lined, everything. Uh, that's all you have to do. All right, let's look at the next one. Number two is make dark frames or use a previously created dark library. Hmm. Let's talk about that for a minute. Okay, let's talk about uh, dark frames. Dark frames, as you remember, are calibration frames. We got uh, dark frames, biased, and flats. And we've done a video some time back about how to make calibration frames. We also went into how to make a library of calibration frames so that you will not have to make them whenever you went to do your pictures. Well, that's where we're at now. That number uh, slot that we're looking at right now that has calibration, uh, well, has dark frames in it, what it means is if you haven't done dark frames or you do not have a library, then you need to do them now. So, what do we need to do? Well, what I would do is Go back up to where it says pre-planning. Remember that imaginary step number three? That's a good place to throw that in. Someday on a rainy day or some evening, especially when it's nice and comfortable, you don't want to do it while it's super hot outdoors, but do it in the evening. That way it's cooled down and your cooling on your camera will work a lot better. So go ahead and do your dark frames now on a rainy day or a dark evening. So when you get ready to go out and do the deep sky objects, you'll have your libraries. Now, remember in the libraries, you'll need to do different ranges. You'll need to do 10 second, 20 second, 30, 40, 50, like this. So that you can choose which one you want. Because sometimes you may want to do a different exposure rate on your uh, on, on your pictures. So, more you have in the library, better off you are. And just remember, you can add to the library. So, that will, that will come in handy. So, if you haven't done your uh, library, or you haven't done your darks, now's the time to do them. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, go to step three. 
Step three, it says, mount the camera and any spacers that are required and rebalance your scope. Now, just what does that mean? Well, now's the time to put your camera on. Some people like to put, when they mount their camera, they, they got to, they, they like it to be straight up and down, square with everything. They pick a spot on their on their telescope. I, I like to line mine up directly in line with uh, my guide scope. It, it happens to be dead 90 degrees above it. Uh, you can do whatever you want, but just remember it will affect how your picture looks at, uh, the orientation of your picture. So it's best to put your camera on at the orientation of the width of your sensor. And that would be the normal one way I, I do it right there. You may at some time have to change it. That's a, whatever you're shooting. All right, let's, let's, let's see what we mean by rebalancing. Rebalance? Why will we have to rebalance? We've already done all that. Well, sometime when you put on a camera, especially if you're going from, say you change your uh, exposure, uh, your uh, F ratio. And say I'm shooting with an F10 scope and I'm doing some real deep sky small stuff. And then I want to do something that's really big, say Andromeda Galaxy. I'm going to have to change the uh, focal ratio on that uh, telescope. I might want to change it to an F5 or F6 or something like that. And I'll put a reducer in there uh, and a flat, reducer flattener in it. And then I'll, I'll have to put in some spacers to line this thing up. Uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. Okay, let's look right down here. I've got the cam I got the camera that I'm going to be using. This is a, a ZWO. Now, on the back, you remember I mentioned something about uh, aligning your telescope, I mean your camera up with your telescope? I'm trying to get that where you can actually see it. Right here, there are some USB ports. And I happen to know that my sensor goes this way, length uh, crossways. So you want to put your sensor, the width, in the, in the east, in east, west, or left and right and your narrow north and south. And that's just the way I'd like to do it. Now, when you put it in the camera, it'll be 90 degrees with the uh, guide scope. Now, that being said, let's, let's go see what we've got to do. Now, this is my ZWO, and when I'm shooting with F10, I have to put an extension in here. Now, this is for my 2-inch focuser. This slides right into my 2-inch focuser and locks down. So, what you, all you see is the camera sticking out. Now, I've already had the telescope balance for this. I already have the focus set for it. I don't even have to refocus. I, I usually fine tune it. That, that we'll talk about that in a minute. But now, so put, now this is for my F10 setup. If I want to shoot F5 or F6, I've got to change this whole thing. So what I do is I take it back off, and I have to change this. Now you'll see why I have to change it in just a minute. This will not fit this so I have to have a different set this is a this also this will fit this camera but it doesn't fit that nut now I slide this right on screw this right in just like you see here and now I'm, I'm ready but see it won't go for my two inch because well I, I wouldn't want to put it in my two inch because it's no way to really center it to be loose so what I want to do with this is I've got to have 55 millimeter from my sensor to the surface of my fill flattener or my reducer. In order to do that, I have to put in some spacers. I have a six and a half and eleven. That's seventeen and a half. So I have to put in some in here to make up for what I got there. Now, this one will actually screw on to this. This will make it convenient. This makes it look like you're hooking up a key adapter. Now, I'll screw this into this. Just like, kind of hard to do with one hand and do all this shooting stuff, but we'll, we'll get there. Okay, so now that screws right in. Now, what happens now is this will go inside my focuser has an adapter on it to fit right inside my focuser. That's a two inch piece there, just like you saw over there. So that will give me from my sensor to the plane of the glass, 
my adapter. It'll give me 55 millimeter. Now, what's, what's that got to do with anything? Well, in order, uh, where I'm getting at is about the balance. If you'll notice, this whole rig, including this, versus the camera and just this. If you look at that, and see, that's, set this down. That's quite a bit of difference. I don't know if you can see that. See? All this, now this right here is heavy. That's a, that's a chunk of glass in there. So, in order to put this in there, I'm going to have now this much sticking out versus this much. This much right here. Uh, you can't see it. I'm going to have, when I put this in, I'm going to have this much sticking out. Where before, I had this much sticking out right here. So, that's a lot of weight. This right here will really weigh a lot. So, you'll have to rebalance your scope. So, don't pop that sucker in there and then go trying to flip around. You might find yourself in a mess. But anyway, that's why you would have to rebalance. Okay, look at number four. Frame on a star close to the object that you're going to be imaging. Now, that means if we're going to be, let's say we're going to be shooting something over here uh, towards the meridian, but just east, uh, we're going to turn over to that area, and uh, there should be a star close by the object you're going to want to shoot. And this is what we're going to focus on. Now, when we get there, we're going to use a batten off mass to focus with. Okay, and then we're going to frame that object, the deep sky object now, not the star. We're going to frame that deep sky object in the camera. And there's where we're going to do our final focusing through the camera. Now, let me show you the device we're going to use. Well, let me apologize for all the noise we got around here. I've got the fan and the computer raising cane blowing because it's hot. The AC I've got off because it makes too much noise, and so that makes the computer run hot, so it's hot in here. And I've got a thunderstorm going on, which it sounds like right now it's unquieted down a little bit. It's still raining, but uh, I've already had to redo this one section three times because uh, when I play it back, there's so much noise on it from the rain on here and the thunder going on, so it's quieted down. We're going to try again to see how it does. All right, what we're looking at is, is focusing. Now, like I said, when you find your item that you want to photograph, we're going to move off of it to a star close by. Now, when you, when you find this little star, it doesn't matter what it is, uh, you're going to put a thing on it called a Bettenhoff mess. Now, this is very cheap. I only paid $10 for this. I think I got it from Amazon. I, I, I ain't going to swear to it, but I mean, it should be able to. And I think I paid $10 for it. And so, uh, it actually will bring... Uh, it looks like an X. It's like an X and then a bar and goes in the middle. Now that bar moves back and forth relative to your focusing. When you get it in focus, it will split that X right in the middle. And you, you'll be able to tell it. You say, well, how am I going to know? You'll know. It's, it looks good. Now, once you do that, we're going to call that rough focus. Now, we're going to move over then to our, our object. Now, you say, well, why did we do that on the star to start with? Well, sometimes you can't see the object. And if you're already out of focus, you won't see it in the telescope. Sometimes the object won't even show up in your telescope until you bring it to a focus. So uh, find your star, you know, where it's going to be right close to it and go ahead and focus. Always try to focus on a star that's in the very vicinity of what you're looking at or shooting. Uh, it will be more accurate focus. Okay, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to move your telescope to the object that you want to image. Now, when you do this, you can use it batting off mass still. Uh, it's particularly if there's a star located, say you're doing, I mean, you can use any little star inside the image you're going to use and still use this and, and still try it. Uh, but you can fine tune your focus right then. Uh, it will be pretty much in focus. Uh, like I was telling you one time in one of my videos, for, uh, first time I used that particular camera, uh, it come to a focus in a heartbeat. I, I was shocked uh, how good that worked. Okay, because I've been using a Hoffman mass, and so this here was a new device to me, and I wanted to try it out. And it worked like a champ. I really do like it. Okay, 
I think we're going to call that it for, for that. Uh, we are going to do a video on this particular session. I know hearing this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But I will do a video on showing you how to use this and bring an object to a focus and then moving to the object and focusing on it. Okay, let's look at number five. We're going to be setting up the autoguider. Now, it should already be set up and installed in your program. And that means that your autoguider program like PHD2 is going to require some setup for you. It's going to need some information about your autoguider, your camera. Uh, the telescope length and all that stuff it's going to need all that and there are some things that you'll have to set in there as defaults well default to your equipment and once you've done all that you won't have to do it but one time you'll do that really up here in that imaginary number three on pre-planning that'd be one of those things you just do a long time before you ever start shooting now when we get it we turn on our autoguider we choose a guide star and we activate calibration now that's all done with that program you, you will actually see a star you can select the star you can tell it to auto select and it will pick one and it'll start a calibration now what what kind of calibration we're talking about now that's the internal calibration that the, uh, the guiding program will do to set up your machine for guiding right now do you have to do it every time most people do uh, per night. Uh, sometime, if you go from one side of the sky to the other, you may want to do another calibration. Uh, but you can also take a calibration. You can save the calibration from the last session and still use it. It may not be as good as what you could get it tonight, but it still probably still work. Uh, once you have done the calibration, uh, you start guiding you, you select guide right now if you're doing a calibration and it's finished and it and it passes it will automatically lock on to the star and start guiding or you can actually wait until you're ready for the imaging program uh, if you don't have an imaging program that you can put objects in before you go out such as generator pro uh, you can put stuff in it to actually <laughs> you can plan the night is what you can actually do but in other programs you can't uh, and you'll have to like right now go ahead and tell it what you want to do and set up the file that you want to pick uh, you know want to store there uh minor stuff but anyway uh that's where we're at right now we are ready to go we're right here at number six can you believe it? it's only eight things in this and number six is where we actually start taking pictures we will now start um well you got to have a program in there to take your pictures with and that's going to be the nebulosity or it's going to be sequence generator pro uh pix insight some other program you need to pick the one you want and basically speaking those will already be set up except for some minor things that you can only set up whenever you're getting ready to actually focus and so that's what i mean here by setting up so you'll actually get your uh, imaging program ready to go right here and you will capture your lights. Now the lights are the images, the pictures that we're talking about. Your main deep sky object. Now you could be a hundred of them, forty of them, fifty of them, whatever how many you're shooting, two hours worth, hour worth, whatever it is, that's where it's happening. Now when you're finished, you're gonna to have to capture flats. Why? Well, the reason is because every time you do something with your telescope, basically it's going to, something's going to be different. You're going to focus. Remember that step back up here? <laughs> it's going to mess it up. You're going to have to do a, you're going to have to do flats every time you do your image. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that because my opinion is whenever you shoot, if you were shooting say M51 tonight and M20 right after you finish that, do you need a set of flats for each one? I say yes. I would I would say yes because one of the basic things that you want to do when you switch from one image to another particularly when it's in the other on the other side of the sky is check your focus that I if you check your focus and you if you even touch the focus you've really invalidated the last flats you did so I would do me a set of flats every time I did an image now, the next thing you do is you're going to set up for the next object. What I need to do? Well, you just go right back up here. Go right over to your star. Find your star next to the object you're going to do. Check your focus. Uh, 
use a use batten off mask. Then, now, this is if you need to. You pull over here and you find it and then check. If it's okay, it's up to you, whatever you want to do. Frame it in your camera. Make sure you already got it ready to go. It should be already calibrated. Uh, if you need, all you have to do is tell it to start and uh, then hit the image program and start taking your pictures. And you'll do that until you're finished. Will you do another set of flats? Absolutely. In my opinion, you will do another set of flats. Once you're finished, the next step is number seven. You shut down your equipment, you park your telescope, shut off your power, and store all the equipment. Need I say more? That would include if you were an observatory, you would shut the, uh, you would park the scope, shut the power off, close the roof, and put everything else up inside that needs to be done and secure it for weather. And then what you need to do, you're through for the night. Number eight is something that people do tomorrow, the day after, whatever. Get them a nice cold beer and sit down with this stuff and start running your program to process your pictures. You're going to calibrate, align, and stack, and combine all frames. Now, that all depends on the program you use. That could be uh, Pixan site you could use, uh, 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 Deep Sky Stacker, Auto Stacker, Nebulosity. I prefer to use Nebulosity. I do all that at one whack in Nebulosity. And the output from this will go to your final processing with the program of your choice. And that could be a lot of programs. Uh, I'm going to pretty much leave that to you. I, I prefer using uh, Photoshop. Uh, you can actually come up with the image right here. Uh, I prefer to only have its output from the calibration and alignment and stacking and then take that image and put it into Photoshop and, and then do the rest of the work there. That's what I prefer to do. That, my friends, actually is a night right there from number one through number six, well, through number seven. It's a night out. And it should not take you long to go from one to number six shouldn't take you very long at all. Now, the first couple of times you, eh, you, until you get used to it. Now, if you're on a portable scope, this is going to take up most of your time right here. But most of the time, that will speed up after you've done it. You know, set you up a little plan like I, I suggested you do. Once you do that, you, this is up right along a couple of times, and you'll be you'll be down here in no time. So this, I hope, will give you a, a, a good start on how to get out there at night because this is a lot of information that gets thrown at you and you say, how in the world am I supposed to keep up with it? And this is one, this is the method I've come up with. Actually, I'm going to, I pretty much do this anyway, but uh, I decided to put it on paper and share this. Okay, so that's going to pretty much wrap this up. Okay, yeah, that'll, that'll pretty much wrap up. This list is not all that that big. It, look, it looks scary at first, but it's not. What what's that? Oh oh yeah, yeah I got on a, I got on a jacket. No, it's not winter time. It's dead of summer, and it's it's hot. It's hot in here. No AC on. But uh, I got this for my birthday. This was my birthday month, and uh, my son actually gave me this for my birthday, and he made a comment on. It. He said uh. Is that going to be something you wear, or is that going to be a display item? And I, I said, no, I'm going to wear it. I said, I'll wear it in my next video. And he just laughed and went on about his business. Well, this is a commemorative jacket. It's from NASA, and uh, I'm a NASA fan. Uh, I do love the space program. Uh, every so often, NASA produces a jacket that's a commemorative. Uh, well, they do one, I think, pretty much for all the flights, but... Uh, they do a commemorative to represent something every so often, and this particular one represents or commemorative to the 100th flight of the space shuttle. Of course, there's a lot more space shuttle flights, but this one here's for the 100th. Uh, and then you know the space shuttle program is no more. But uh, it's a nice jacket. Uh, thank you, son. And uh, I thought everybody would like to have a look. See, see, now it's pretty. Yeah, got a nice flag on here. Uh, the medallion that represents uh, the 100th flight, and of course an F M. Okay, let's get back to our uh, how to. Don't let that scare you. There's some things in there that we're going to actually make a video to assist you. I know, I know all this information. So, oh, what in the world am I going to do? Well, you take this list and you do use it. Use this list. 
for a few times when you're setting up. Now don't go out there tonight and try to throw this thing together. You need to go and look back, look at all your stuff, see what, remember the one, I, the video we did about what you need to do for uh, astrophotography? You need to look at that one. Because if you'll notice, that's mixed into this. Uh, those are already there. In the first five steps, you're taking care of them. Uh, but they're done one time. You don't have to do them but one time. Anyhow, um, you need to go through your system, make sure you're ready, and then you go out, take the list out with you, and go right down the list. Uh, there are some things on there that will be videos, uh, like, uh, let's see, we're going to use like the, uh, setting up for the frame and focusing with the batten off mask. We'll do a video on that, show you how to use it, and I'll do a video about the, uh, using the altogether, how to set that up and how to actually use it on the telescope and i'll probably go one step further i might even make another video that will actually show you how to drift the line with your uh, uh auto guider and uh, will make it a whole lot easier to, to do a drift line okay uh as far as processing the last one down there uh that will probably be in its own right but the very last well I won't say that right this minute. One of the big videos I want to do at the end of this is a video taking this chart myself and go out here into the observatory and we'll, we'll do a night. We'll put the film on and let her stay and we'll do the entire night. Now, that's going to be a long film. The only thing is uh, it won't be long if you're doing it because you will all won't have to explain it and you won't have to show the things and all this stuff. You just go right down the list. Pop, 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 right on down. Uh, you'll be surprised that once you start doing this how fast that will be It will be very quick getting from number one to number six number six remember is when you're shooting the pictures So it won't take long to get there once you've done this a couple of times What takes so long is trying to explain what you need to do and why you need to do it uh, So spend a little time with it. Look at it. Try to enjoy it Okay, we're going to wrap this up uh, If you like what you saw hit like down below if uh, this is your first time go back and click uh, click subscribe and, and ring that little bell and go back in there and look at some of the other videos uh this right here assumes that you've looked at some videos that's about another i don't know probably i don't know 20 or 30 videos i don't know how many is in there uh before this one so get in there and look uh enjoy yourself and try to learn something with your telescope so until next time clear skies and keep looking up.